Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Greg Bendian, your host, where we get into some of the uh, inside baseball of music. And uh, I'm very happy to have a guest today who I've been an admirer of for many years as a fan of his work with XTC. He's a drummer extraordinaire. He's known for his classic drum sound and his iconic drum parts on recordings from XTC like Drums and Wires, Black Sea, English Settlement, and of course, their first two records. And I'm just so pleased to welcome Terry Chambers to the broadcast. Hi, Terry, how are you? Hi, Greg, I'm fine, thank you, yourself? <laughs> good, good, it's so nice to see you. I know you don't do a lot of interviews, so I'm, I'm, I feel very privileged to speak with you. Well, when you're the guy that's sat at the back, you're not really in the spotlight, so... Uh... <laughs> Well, Unless, of course, you're somebody like Dave Clark or Billy Cobham. <laughs> <laughs> well, we noticed you. Drummers have noticed you and uh, hold you in very high regard for your contributions to the music and really to, to the notion of, of how good drums could sound on a recording. So I, I thought maybe we could jump in and, and talk a little bit about your early years. I, I'm very curious about your your sort of introduction to music and you know what you were listening to as a young lad what kind of stuff really sparked you and you know maybe drummers that you were into uh did you you grew up in swindon right that's correct yeah we all did yes and what kind of stuff were you into uh as a young man i know you you were into soccer as well right yeah um you know but i think um I guess, as with the rest of the guys, you know, it's really the sort of like the 60s that um, when you become, you know, a young adolescent, you know, the Beatles, the Kinks, the Rolling Stones, those sort of good bands um, really started to make a difference, you know. Um, and it, it just, um, it was a good time to be around as a, as a young teenager um it was exciting times it seemed to be a lot of fun um yeah so really that was the period of time where i suppose i i i, I started to think that this seems like a a, a good way of of living yeah so what kind of stuff was was on the radio i know dave gregory had mentioned to me that pirate radio was the main way that he heard songs yeah um, I mean, I think that may have been a little bit later that um, Radio Caroline and Radio Luxembourg and they were pirate radio stations in as much as they were broadcast from uh, ships out in um, by the Isle of Man somewhere or in the English Channel, depending on who it was. And um, a lot of stuff that was not being played on um, normal BBC radio, they wouldn't take this stuff up. Um, guys like John Peel and that were um, playing the playing the more exploratory uh, music, the more experimental stuff, you know. And I think um, Dave was regarding probably thinking about that. A anything that comes to mind that you heard that sort of blew your mind? Um, I wasn't really listening to those radio stations myself, but. Um, it's your job to say there's there's a vast amount of things um that uh, i really think the first band that i really liked i guess was probably the kinks you know yeah uh, yeah i think um, lola was something when i was about 11 years of age i thought wow you know what a what a song this is you know i mean i had no idea of what the meaning of the thing was at all but it just seemed seemed like a great tune to me, um, uh, and just such a memorable piece of music. You know, I, I, I thought it was fantastic. So that was one of the early ones for me. Mm, yeah, yeah. And and anything uh, like the Who or some of the harder stuff? Um, not really. Not at that point. Um, you know, I think it was sort of like things like the Dave Clark Five. That was another band. You know, maybe the 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 sort of mid-60s sort of stuff was the very beginning of that. And then naturally, 
come the 1969 musical explosion for um, you know the likes of Woodstock and so on and so forth. Um, 69, there just seemed to be, yeah, it was um, about 1969 when things started to kick off. Um, it says, um, you know, with the release of the first Zeppelin album, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, that type of thing. So it was sort of like late 68, 69 was uh, a massive turning point, you know, where um, the heavy side of things really started to kick in. And, and once again, it was it was exciting times to be around, you know. For sure. Um, were you drumming by then? Um, I sort of started about then. It was 60, 69 is when I started. I was about 15. I think inspired by these people, you know. Um, you know, thinking, wow, you know, and I mean, originally I wanted to play piano, but my father, he, he didn't sort of think that having a big, big piece of furniture like that in the house was <laughs> was going to do me much good. Um, for some reason, I just sort of decided that maybe drums, I don't know, I, I can't really put my finger on it, but um, I was just, yeah, more interested in that rather than a guitar, I think. What was your first drum set? Do you remember? Yeah, it was a Broadway kit made by John Gray. And it was uh, a four piece, um, lovely blue color, not too dissimilar to the shirt that you're wearing. Um, yeah, it was a, uh, I never had any drum heads on the bottom of this thing. I remember that. And um, yeah, it was, um, and I, I brought this thing up. I didn't even know how to set it up. I got the thing home eventually my dad sort of said because i saved up for it myself uh -huh. um you know doing part-time work and one thing or another i think my dad um felt that um you know being as though i'd made that much effort uh maybe it was worth it and i said i'd like to buy this drum kit so i don't know and in a moment, moment of my father's weakness <laughs> he said um yeah okay then you know which was quite a surprise really because um you know obviously trying to learn the, the 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 drum kit was probably going to be um uh a lot louder and noisier than an acoustic uh piano you know but um i only did it when he was at work anyway and you know they weren't at home so yeah so that was the early days yeah my parents barely put up with it but we had a curfew where i could not play after 6 p.m <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much the, the way it was. I used to drive my next door neighbor crazy. And sometimes he would go out in the backyard. If he couldn't beat it, he'd join it. And he'd be in the backyard hitting these biscuit things and one thing or another trying to sort of act. I mean, obviously, I couldn't hear what he was doing. But I was only aware of this when my mum came home and said, there's something wrong with John next door. I said, well, what's his, what's his problem? She said, well, he's, he's marching up and down the yard, smashing this biscuit tin with a with some sort of spoon i said well you know <laughs> yeah so well he was either my first fan or um <laughs> or, or or maybe not <laughs> yeah maybe he was your first enemy <laughs> yeah exactly so um there were as you say there were there were times where I, when i was allowed to play uh, uh, and uh, obviously a curfew at six or whenever you know Sure, that that's uh, that's very familiar sounding to me. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Zeppelin, Sabbath, uh, Purple; those bands, very yeah. important bands to me as a young man as well. Uh, were you into uh, John Bonham and Bill Ward and and uh, those guys? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, another one that uh, I failed to mention, of course, was Simon Kirk of Free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And a little, a little later, perhaps Brian Danny of Thin Lizzy, who we we ended we we did a, a a gig with them of all things back in 1974. Um, I mean, these guys were just well, almost when when you saw those guys, it, it made you wonder whether you could ever um, be good enough. Basically, you know, I mean, how do you get that good? <laughs> you know? So. Um, I guess I just sort of um, endeavoured to uh, be as good as I could and, and listen to a lot of those guys, um, you know, which, and, and those guys in turn 
all listen to guys like Buddy Rich, um, Louis Belson, obviously Hal Blaine, Cutting Crew, those sort of guys. Um, so in a sense, I suppose they inspired me because I was inspired by those guys as well. You make an excellent point because in the 60s, there really weren't rock drummers as much as there were jazz drummers who were transitioning yeah. to a heavier, more aggressive music, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. You know, so guys like Ginger Baker, they were listening to Buddy. They were listening to yeah. Louis Belson. Yeah. I mean, Charlie Watts is a, is a jazz drummer, basically, you know? Yeah, and he, he, loves, he loves to play his jazz. So, um, yeah, um, really, the um, when the Beatles and uh, the Rolling Stones came along, they really kicked these jazz guys in the backside, really, didn't they? <laughs> they did. Yeah, jazz sort of sort of went to the side as rock took over, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Did you get to see any of those bands when you were a young man? Um, I saw, yeah, Black Sabbath, um, Deep Purple, yes, on more than one occasion, three or four occasions, actually, with Bill Bruford, another um, highly inspirational uh, drummer. Great. Um, yeah, Jethro Tull, um, yeah, quite a few. So did you see Tall with Clive Bunker? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I think I must have saw them probably in about 73 or 74. So was, was he drumming with them then? Well, by then, I th it's Barry Barlow. Yeah, I think it might have been, yeah. Yeah, I can't say for sure, but um, that was about the time I saw him, I think, yeah. So you saw Zeppelin and Sabbath? No, no, I didn't see Zeppelin at all. I saw Sabbath, yeah, but I didn't see Zeppelin. How loud was Sabbath? Yeah, I think they were extremely loud. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, um, I saw the, the a place called the Bristol Colston Hall, which um, later on, um, I also saw Deep Purple there and Jethro Tull and Wishbone Ash. Um, mm -hmm. We, we as, as XTC, we ended up playing there too, which was um, uh, quite something to think that you're on the same stage as, as those guys that um, I, I mentioned, you know, and thinking, well, I can remember being in that seat over there watching these fellows, you know. So, yeah, that was quite something. Yeah, so you grew up knowing Colin, right, from an early school age? No, uh, Andy and Colin went to school together. Um, I met Colin probably when I was about 17, when I shouldn't have been in a pub. And um, I met him there and we had similar interests in as much that we both had uh, extremely long hair, which is <laughs> I thought his hair is longer than mine. Um, you know, so there was sort of like a, a bit of an interest there. And likewise, um, you know, we ended up going to the um, local college that used to host uh, bands. And, um, you know, found that he was there and we sort of just got to know each other, really, by um, uh, by chance of, of, of watching some of these bands. And um, then it became apparent that he played bass and um, I played drums. So, you know, it sort of stemmed from there, really. And he knew Andy. And, um, yeah, that was really the, the beginning of um, our relationship, which is ex well gone for nearly 50 years now <laughs> indeed so was there much of a, a playing scene in the swindon area no it was pretty ordinary disco was um i mean there was a couple of discotheques um but really original music uh situation was pretty much there was a few isolated gigs in the local town hall that we managed later on to um, get a couple of supports doing uh, but mainly it was the the Swindon College that um, the uh, students put on um, regular gigs and they became sort of part of pretty much um, a British tour for bands of uh, you know like the Pink Fairies, Hawkwind, um, you know, these type of bands, um, most of the college type bands, uh, Thin Lizzy as well. Once again, I say um, we supported them there, actually, on occasion. So um, what kind of stuff were you into playing around that time where you met Colin and Andy? Was it 
heavier, more sort of edgy stuff? Yeah, it was pretty much that heavy stuff, as I say, this free Simon Kirk, you know, I mean, the beauty of that was it was sort of slow, generally speaking, in tempo, and he was very precise in what he did, and you could actually think, ah, he's playing hi-hat there, he's playing bass drum there, and you could distinguish what he was actually doing, because it was quite uh, open and empty. You know, which enabled you, ah, that's what he's doing there, because quite a few of the other guys were playing, especially people like uh, Ian Pace, I mean, they were doing some things like Speed King, you know, I mean, for heaven's sake, you know, I mean, I, I still can't <laughs> quite fathom it ain't exactly what he's doing there now, but, you know, um, Simon Kirk enabled you to um, pick up what he was doing you know, which I thought was very good from a, a learning point of view. And you're also talking about drummers that had a tremendous feel. Yeah. I mean, those guys were basically bluesy sort of players, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I like what you're, what you're saying about Simon Kirk, because it, it kind of even sets up what you end up doing with the drums, which is creating a drum part that leaves space for all the other instruments. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty vital, really. I mean, um, you'll notice that there's not too many real drum fills as such within the XTC um, uh, material that I certainly played on, um, mainly for that reason. It was, you know, there was, there was quite a bit going on there as regards either you know, the two guitar situation, um, plus some keyboard stuff. So really things can get a little cloudy there, you know, so quite often it's, you know, um, rhythmically you have to sort of like know when to play and when not to play. Um, and um, yeah, and, and allow the thing to breathe, you know, without it being completely um, stifled with all sorts of fills and stuff going on. So, um, yeah, it was, um, that was pretty much the way it went, I think. Yeah, I never thought of you as a busy player, and I also never thought of you as a big white noise generator landing on those cymbals and hanging out. Yeah, uh, they were sort of like punctuation marks, I suppose, um, in a sense. Um, yeah, uh, in the early stuff, of course, it was quite frantic. But that was a sign of the times. I mean, um, in order to get gigs at that particular point in time, um, you know, sort of 76, 77, you know, the punk thing was happening um, and everything was, I mean, even if you couldn't play particularly well there, as long as it was fast and frantic, it was exciting. And um, that's what it was about, really. Unfortunately, um, you know, uh, People started to learn to play a little bit better after that, and um, you know, uh, started the, 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 the you know people started to sort of like uh, concern themselves with more with melody and harmony and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, so the cream sort of uh, gradually rose to the top, I guess, and yeah. quite a few of the other guys, you know, if if they couldn't write a decent song, well, eventually you got sort of found out, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it wouldn't last that long. No, it was um, it was it was a new broom for a while there. I mean, basically, as you know, the story. Um, a lot of the bigger bands then, you know, and I include, um, you know, the Emerson, Lake and Palmer's, uh, Pink Floyd, these sort of bands that were really massive bands, um, started to play um, less regularly. You know, because it was such a, a costly thing for them to go on and put these big shows on. And basically, I think um, people still wanted to see bands down the pub, you know, uh, sort of pub bands. And um, that's, that's where this, that sort of punk movement came from. It's like, you know, you know, just get up there and do something, you know, because uh, people didn't have the opportunity to see the big stars. Oh, that's an interesting take on that situation. I definitely always think about how things change over from period to period in the music and definitely things got more simplified as punk came in and 
kind of took over from Prague. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, even even those bands sort of ended up playing in bigger bigger uh, theaters. So the thing, although it changed for a short period of time, possibly five years, but eventually um, the demand was such then that they ended up playing the bigger stadiums, you know? So, so uh, yeah, but, um, you know, there seemed to be room for everybody, I guess. Yeah, to, to a large extent, bands that could transition to a poppier sound continued, groups like Genesis or King Crimson. Yeah. Um, so, were you in the the first was the first thing that you did with colin and the guys star park yeah pretty much um yeah we were the helium kids at one point there um yeah we had several name changes and one thing or another and and um we had a vocalist at one point there and it became pretty apparent to andy that uh, he wasn't delivering the the songs that he was writing in the, in the style that he felt um, he wanted, you know. So in the end, Andy actually became the reluctant vocalist of the band. I mean, he never claimed to be a, a singer or anything of that nature, but uh, it was just that um, his material wasn't, uh, didn't seem to be getting delivered by that particular singer. We had a couple actually that tried, but, uh, it just wasn't right, you know, it was sort of, um, you know, they were still doing the sort of the cock rock thing, you know, and <laughs> that really wasn't what Partridge was about at all. <laughs> so what was the style of those early bands? Um, well, I mean, we were sort of, um, I mean, we supported Budgie, for example. Yeah. I mean, we were sort of, as I said, Harp On, but Thin Lizzy, um, and, and several sort of bands of that nature. Um, so we were sort of playing something along those lines, I guess, you know, and there was a few covers involved there as well. So, um, yeah, uh, but I think, um, you know, Andy had this sort of idea of, we were sort of ready for change as well. And then when this sort of punk thing sort of took place, it was, uh, time to sort of put that suit away and, and, and basically get another suit. <laughs> you know, which uh, was a little bit more in keeping with what was going on at the time. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting remark because, you know, th that moment in in 69 where Miles Davis sees Jimi Hendrix and he says, oh, I can't wear a suit and tie on stage anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, of, of that era, I mean, there was there was... You know, some of the latecomers to the um, to the heavier music scene um, ended up sort of more or less leaving the United Kingdom, really. I mean, Fleetwood Mac, bands like that, they went and based themselves in the States, as you know. Um, Super Tramp were another band that, that sort of decided, well, it's time for us to move over there because that's where the big money is still available to, to the likes of them. Even even to the extent of uh, bands like the Babies went over there, you know, because they were at the the tail end of um, that glam rock type of thing there, and uh, I think John Waite basically, you know, went over there and um, had more success there than what they were doing sort of over in the UK. It's so strange because obviously Hendrix went from the US to London. Yeah. To make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Zeppelin did very much the same. I mean, Zeppelin weren't doing much in this country. There it was the States that uh, where they signed to Atlantic Records that really, you know, um, they made it there before they made it over here. It's quite odd. Well, also, I think there's the exotic factor. You know, it, it, if it's not from here and it's from somewhere else, maybe it's more valuable. And I, I see this trend in UK bands not being appreciated in the UK. And that yeah. would even include Queen, who didn't play the UK for years because they thought, you know, sod it. I'm not, you know, we're not getting across here. Yeah, I mean, XTC to a certain extent um, were victims of that as well because of the place we came from. You know, it was quite, quite uh, laughable, really. I mean, no more so than perhaps Akron, Ohio, where uh, obviously Devo are from, you know. So, you know, these are the sort of places, well, they're not exactly renowned for their rock and roll history. 
Um, although there are a few individuals that have come from Swindon, uh, Rick Davis being one of Super Tramp and Justin Hayward as well. But uh, really, Justin Hayward they, from Moody Blues is from Swindon. Yeah, yeah. I didn't and know. Um, uh, yeah, these guys um, had to leave. You know, had to get out of get out of town really if you wanted to achieve anything. I mean, likewise with XTC, we had to really go to London there. Um, you know, which was the place to be seen to be playing in order to get going, you know? So, um, yeah, but being from not the main scene, not being from London and being from Swindon or being yeah. from Akron, not from New York City, yeah. you know, you kind of have your own greenhouse, you have your own system, you have your, you're, you're not influenced as much by everybody doing the same kind of thing in the same place. That's exactly what took place in London, you know, I mean, the, the list of uh, punk bands and one thing or another, I mean, is endless. And I mean, they all sounded very, very similar. And I guess our advantage was the fact that we were from um, out of town and um, became a little bit more individualistic as, as a result of that, you know, rather than getting tangled up with the same sort of uh, circle, if you like. Yeah. And, and sonically, you guys had many more influences, you know, reggae and dub. Yeah. You know, the, 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 you know, rock and roll, but in sort of the more classic sense of it. Yeah. So um, when the band becomes XTC proper, is that when Barry Andrews comes in? Yeah. Um... I think John Perkins may have played um, keyboards in the very first XTC stuff that um, didn't actually get recorded, but um, Andrews sort of joined, John Perkins left, uh, uh, Partridge managed to get out of uh, Barry Andrews on some drunken session, they didn't, they didn't even know it, it, it was just, uh, yeah, you, you got keyboards. And he could hold his beer, and the next thing you know, he was basically in the band. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a bit like that. You know, we were desperate to get hold of somebody because, um, you know, I think we had a few things lined up that we needed to do and just needed somebody to tinkle the ivories of some sort. And um, Andrews ended up fitting the bill at that point in time. You know, Andy Partridge told me an interesting story about Barry coming in thinking it was a deep purple type of thing with you know the big <laughs> organ distortion sound and and uh and kind of having to be readdressed and say no no you know do something different don't do that yeah do you remember that yeah yeah um yeah and he was right he, he just wanted somebody um you know playing those sort of keyboards that um you know we're more like, um, say, Alvis Costello, something of that nature, the type of the, the way that they use uh, keyboards. Um, yeah, something that, um, you know, I mean, people, people basically wanted to leave the Hammond organ thing where it was for that particular point in time, you know. Um, it didn't seem much point going down that angle. We needed to sort of go more of the Fireball XL5 type of uh, um, cartoon puppetry sort of uh, way of looking at uh, keyboards. Well, also the humor factor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, that's it's sort of a more fun sound. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It was Parky. more, um, we're not really taking this too seriously sort of sound, you know? It's yeah. um, just, yeah, let's just have some fun doing it and see where it takes us sort of sound. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, when when you guys got signed finally did you did you have john lecky lined up no um we had no we had nobody really um he came on the recommendation of virgin records who we were signed to um he was available and um that's just just the way it worked out it could have been anybody really and you guys uh were touring off of the first album pretty intensely right away i mean we were we were doing quite a few um gigs even before that so the early stuff that we did 
was pretty well um, well uh, road worthy, if you understand what I mean. You know, we'd already played this stuff uh, up and down the country quite a, f quite a few times before we actually went in to record it. So, uh, yeah, we sort of ironed out um, some of the um, and, and cut away some of the the fat and kept the lean. You know, um, sometimes when when you you're in a studio there, you can tend to get a little bit carried away with things and. Um, I think um, the the live situation um, you need to simplify it a little bit more so that um, you get the the message over. Yeah, well, and also it was was it ever danceable? Was that considered a dance music at that time? Well, I think people used to pogo to it, if that can be <laughs> described as a dance. Um, yeah, I think people used to jump up and down and move and shake a bit. Yeah, but uh, whether you would call that actual dancing or not, um, <laughs> that's sort of uh, another story, really. Yeah, it's not disco. No, absolutely not. No. <laughs> well, the, the, you know, the early recordings are, are, are so cool to hear you guys mixing it up. And I know that you were thrown in with this idea of punk or new wave. And you were always more sophisticated than that, always more versatile than that. Uh, you know, what what kind of stuff was going on in the drum rhythm section at that time with you and Colin in terms of thinking about feel or thinking about tempo or thinking about rhythm? Like, what, what were you guys into at that point? Uh, I mean, I think... Um... Yeah, we were listening to a lot of stuff. I mean, even even some disco stuff, believe it or not. Um, yeah, all, all sorts of stuff, really. Yeah, we, were, we were trying to sort of draw things from everywhere, really. And, um, and, and rather than pigeonholing ourselves down in one channel sort of thing there, we were trying to draw these things from, from all aspects of it. Um, and I think that's really what makes the band what it is, 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 you know, we didn't play it with blinkers on. We, we tried to absorb as much from all manner of, um, cause I mean, Andy's, uh, father was a jazz player, yeah. you know, a drummer. Um, so Andy's got sort of quite a, a jazzy sort of background and, uh, Dave, for instance, he's got more of a classical sort of background in a sense, you know? And Colin and I were pretty much sort of um, sort of hard rock sort of roots, really. Um, so you know that you put that combination together, and I guess that's that's what 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 we ended up with. So when you're working on the the first couple of albums of stuff, and I'm talking about you know like songs like "Life Is Good in the Greenhouse" or you know "Radios in Motion" or uh beat town are, are these songs that are brought in either as demos by andy or are they just rehearsal pieces where you and colin are working out what you're going to do does andy have ideas of what he wants from you what's what's the general work process for developing that those songs well basically andy would um record these things on a cassette of just himself an acoustic guitar or electric guitar or whatever and just sort of singing over the top of it. and he would bring these to the rehearsal and say listen this is radios in motion you know and um then we would hash it out in 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 um obviously you know you'd have some sort of the, the thing would be in a certain tempo you know 120 beats per minute or whatever um and i always used to just sort of naturally just go to the hi-hat snare and bass drum and just sort of keep time with this thing and and he'd play the thing and you just sort of keep a bit of time one way or another and colin would know you know the key and and just plot around and we just sort of knock these things around um you know and if we got to a point there where um you know we wanted to make it a little bit more interesting or what's the subject matter about you know um you know is it um sh should we try and make it a little bit more industrial sounding or should it be a little bit more pastoral or something you know so 
that comes into it afterwards once you sort of realize what this thing's starting to feel like um you know um, does it need to be empty or or does it need to be fast and busy you know so you, we just sort of knock these things around really and um hopefully come up with a version of it that um that the songwriter was happy with <laughs> sure i mean i i kind of imagine that you'd be jamming on these things a little bit and then somebody yeah. does something and they say oh yeah that that works and you kind yeah. of hone in yeah that's pretty much the way it works yeah it's like um really as i say it's, it was basically on nine times out of ten it was always hi-hat snare and bass drum just to keep get the feel of the thing you know and then you know the, th the thing would be structured either you know intro verse chorus solo verse chorus whatever um you know there'd be four bars of this eight bars of that or whatever and the thing would be sort of worked out you know and it was all sort of done from memory i, mean, I think dave was the only one in the band that could read music to be honest so <laughs> the rest of us usually just sort of do it by by ear and by memory of course well you know you you always had very meticulous drum parts and and the drum parts were always really part of the form of the song part of the structure of the song part of the music um when did you really start to think of the drum set in terms of the tom toms being part of the ride or the, the rhythm component of your drum parts uh, as I say, it sort of depended on, on what the song required. As I say, if it was sort of like an industrial sounding thing there, or it was some things like ball and chain, for example, um, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be much sort of use, I don't think, in a light sort of sense. It needed to have this sort of, you know, big ball and it needed sort of uh, something on it that... Um, gave the impression that yes this is what it needs you know um and likewise with some of the other stuff it was quite empty as you mentioned uh life is good in the greenhouse and things like complicated games something like that they were very empty but you know sort of big and meaningful sort of sounding things you know um so those things were worked out depending on the requirements of the lyrics uh, uh, in a sense you know and what Andy or Colin on his songs, uh, what message they were trying to get over. And we tried to create something along the lines that um, seemed believable. Yes, <laughs> believable, appropriate, uh, and, and very much, uh, you know, a part of the song. And yes, you, you're absolutely spot on about Ball and Chain, where you want to hear some machinery. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Making Plans for Nigel was another one. I mean, it's basically a, a, about the guy that um, works in a steel foundry, you know. So really, you want that sort of, you want to hear these, you know, industrial noises sort of taking place um, seem to be the right way to go. Yes, that, it's the perfect way to go. Um, I, I'm curious about the transition from John Lecky to working with Steve Lillywhite and, and you Padgham where this new drum sound comes into fruition. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, we did um, the first EP with John and the first two albums with John as well. And it, uh, at that point there, the record company were a little bit concerned that we hadn't had a single because it was all about singles in, the, in those days. Um, Unlike the Led, the Led Zeppelin situation there, where they could give a, a, a hoot about uh, singles so much, you know what I mean? It was all about the albums, and they weren't wor worried about going on top of the pops and things like that, which is a program over here that um, everybody used to strive to get onto. And, uh, and that, that's where the record companies were going to make their money, you know, single sell. Uh, uh, and up to that point, 78, we hadn't had any of that sort of single success. Um, not that that was um, John's fault. It was perhaps the material just well, 
you know, wasn't required. A Statue of Liberty, for example, off the first record, didn't get even played by the BBC because of uh, some ludicrous lyric that was in it. Um, you know, yet uh, you go back and listen to some of the stuff that they have played on there, and uh, perhaps they were, perhaps they just 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 didn't like the band. Um, but that was nothing to do with um, John. I mean, John could only record the songs that we had, and I, th I think he did an extremely good job of uh, 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 of recording the songs at that particular point in time in seventy seven, seventy eight. Um, and Virgin sort of felt it was time for a change, um, you know, because you can't go through, unless you're George Martin, of course, there with the Beatles, and, um, you know, you've got that successful, if, if you had successful, you stick with it, I guess. But um, Virgin felt it was time for us to sort of perhaps get a new team in. And that's where Steve Lillywhite, and we, we liked what Steve Lillywhite did on the Ultravox album. Uh, that was out at that particular point in time. I particularly liked it, and um, yeah, I mean, he seemed to have a, a very, very good sound. And as and as luck would have it, Hugh Pageant was the engineer at the studio at the time, and I don't think either of them had worked together before. Um, but that was the team that uh, was put in charge of putting the Drums and Wires album together. Was there also a, a Susie and the Banshees record that was something you guys heard? Um, I, I can't recall it myself. Perhaps one of the others did. And uh, did Steve Lillywhite do that? He may have made it. Yes. So it was kind of like uh, Steve's sound on those records was something yeah. that, I, that I guess Andy had heard also. And Possibly. I, I don't know whether Susie and the Banshees used him before us or not. I couldn't, I couldn't say. But I, I certainly know the Ultra Rocks thing did, yeah. So, obviously, the 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 beat, the patterns that you play on, on making plans for Nigel are classic, iconic drum parts, and that drum sound from uh, the Stone Room, which was yeah. a, a special room built at the Townhouse, right? Yeah, yeah, correct, yeah. So, were you the first drummer to play and record in that room? I don't think so, no. But no, I'm was, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I wasn't. No. Okay. So, what was but, your your impression when you first started banging around in there? Well, I thought, wow, <laughs> wow, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like um, because up to that point, the drums were always recorded with these big carpets, and everything was all dead. You know. And for the first time in my life, I thought, Jesus, you know, this this is starting to sound like John Bonham, you know, because I mean, obviously, Jimmy Page had recorded John Bonham with uh, lots of ambient microphones and in uh, Headley Grange, I think, springs to mind where there's a room there and it had this enormous staircase or something like that. And, and, and these drums started to... I thought, well, I might not be able to play like Bonham, but I'm sort of starting to sound like him a little bit, you know. So, and likewise, it seemed to um, uh, be right for some of the songs, you know. It seemed to sort of go into this, wow, you know, this is just too good a sound not to use, basically. So I think uh, a lot of the stuff was based around that. It was quite an exciting sound in there. Yeah, you, you know, you make a very good point about Bonham being recorded at the bottom of a staircase on yeah. uh, when the levee breaks. Yeah. So when the levee breaks happens, drums have, have started to, to have a big life and, and a, a atmosphere yeah. to them. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing with Zeppelin is basically they were a three-piece band. I mean, there's only a guitar, a bass. I mean, okay, John Boy, uh, Jones played a little bit of keyboard on there on the side but basically at any given point in time it was just bass guitar and drums uh you know and and the lead guitar and obviously robert plant singing and maybe doing a bit of tambourine but uh fundamentally i mean yeah i mean most of those bands back in those days i mean sabbath were the same three three instruments you know which um, allowed for the drums to you know they had had, had a lot more space there yeah, good point. Um, so the music that you guys are playing for Drums and Wires 
has more space for the drums. But also, I guess what I'm wondering is, did you change anything when you were hearing how things were going in that room? Because obviously there can't be a lot of symbols. It's not going to work in that resonant space. But also, uh, were you overdubbing any drum parts or are you just in there playing your parts? I think uh, basically it's, it's just one take stuff. I think there was, uh, for instance, um, the actual sound on um, Making Plans for Nigel, which is that, <laughs> is actually just a keyboard note. At that yeah, time. It, sang, it, it actually sounded better because I didn't know, I don't think I had a China symbol at that point, um, which is what I use now. But um, yeah, so in that regard there, I mean, if that can be considered to be an overdub, then it is. But basically, it's just a percussive note on one key on a, on a keyboard. Uh, but basically, the drums were just played as they were. I don't, I can't recall on that particular record whether uh, anything was fattened up at all with a second snare or anything. Not, not that I recall. I think okay. they were pretty much the parts were pretty much as they were. All right. So in, in, in a, a session video that I saw on Black Sea where you're playing just hi hats separately, that might have been an example of something where you wanted a little extra sound from the hats. Oh, uh, that was from where? Um, Towers of London recording a video from the studio. Yeah, that was um, that was mined anyway, I think. I think that was already a recording. I don't think that was, um, I think we were miming to that for the specifics of the film. I don't think, um, I don't know whether that was just sort of sound, getting the sound or whatever, I don't know. But um, that, uh, as far as I know, that was just um, already recorded. I think we just mined that mm. for the purposes of the film. So it wouldn't have been the case where you had some pieces where you'd lay down the snare separately or you'd lay down the tom well, part separately. Um, yeah, I mean, for example, Tears of Lindell, I remember there was, um, I think that industrial sound on that for the Tears of Lindell thing, I think it was a fire extinguisher was used. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was, there was a few bits and pieces like that that were added if the sound sort of just justified being there, I guess, to give it some sort of, um, yeah, that Towers of London working man, you know, on his anvil type of thing. And that was a closer sound than anything I could get on the drum kit. So I think it was a um, uh, a fire extinguisher, if I remember rightly. Yeah, that's in the video. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there, there you go. <laughs> now, you, you know, when we're talking about that period of, of Drums and Wires, Black Sea, I see that what what you're saying now is it's those songs are really made to be taken out and played. They're they're not studio craft. Yeah. One classic moment I had to ask you about the the, the piece travels in neon, where yeah. it's just that you know thunderous tribal drumming going on with that droning guitar and and uh, Andy's haunting melody. Uh, yeah. Any recollections of that session because that's such an incredibly powerful piece. Well, so I'm told, I can't remember for sure, but apparently I did that in one take. It was the very first take, so I just got lucky there, I guess. Um, yeah, it was just one of those things. I think um, it, it sort of, from what I recall, I, I think I was just sort of just messing around myself with, a, with different drum patterns and, you know, bits and pieces there. And I think... Um, Andy quite liked the way this was going. And I think when, when this thing actually got into the stone room and, and was recorded in there, it was, it was the right, right place for it, you know? So it was, it was a question of, um, cause I don't think it would have been the same song had it been recorded um, perhaps a couple of years prior to that in, in, in the old, you know, dampened down uh, drums, uh, situation you know which was um, all padded here and there and everywhere whereas this thing allowed itself it sort of had a, a, a life form of its own in a sense so yeah. um yeah it just seemed to work that that and paper and iron 
Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, in that in that room, there's not much else you can do with your drums other than that. <laughs> it, uh, you know, because it just, they just explode, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a perfect marriage of your concept and the sound oh. because you're talking about leaving space. You're talking about uh, a drum pattern that's going to be able to fit in with a bass pattern that's going to leave room for the yeah. vocal and the guitar parts. It's beautifully engineered and it's it's beautifully executed. But I have yeah. to say, on, on Travels, you are just beating the shit out of that drum set. <laughs> well... I must give credit to Hugh Padgham. I mean, he was the guy that positioned the microphones in certain ways and uh, gated these things and one thing. Or so, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those chance things. It was a decent room and we had a, you know, one of the, arguably one of the best engineers around, a great producer. And um, it was, it was good fun to be there. You know, it was, it was a, everybody you know there was not an argument to be had that i i no, it was just fun you know and i it was just thoroughly enjoyable from what i could i can remember and, you know it helps if you know your stuff as well and we were playing live all the time to the point where um you know i think andy started to get a bit tired of it um but um, the songs were worked then, you know, and they would sort of, as I say, they, they we didn't play Travels and Nihil on live. I don't think we did anyway at that particular point in time. But a lot of those songs had already been played quite a bit live before we went into the studio and recorded them. So we knew pretty much, you know, I mean, and, that, and, and in, in those days too, studio time was expensive. So you really wanted to be in there and make sure that uh, every uh, aspect of your time was uh, made useful, you know? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, you can give credit as much as you want to you, Padgham, but I had him on the program recently and, you know, he and, and John Lecky, who I've also spoken with, were just singing your praises as just one of the greatest, you know, crack drummers that came in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take too, no, too much notice of what those guys say. <laughs> All right, well, we'll take it. No, they're good, they're good. no, they're good guys. I mean, yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> but no, you, you know, you were making those sounds and they were capturing them. And, you know, um, the amount of creativity in the drum department in the XCC music is really what brought me to the music because I had a friend who was a drummer and he said to me, you got to hear these, these guys XTC. You don't know them? I said, no, I don't really know them. Well, check out... The, you know, these drum parts, check out how they fit into the song, check out how they move the song forward. And I was hooked right away. And then, you know, he had been turned on by a drummer and then I subsequently have turned drummers on to your stuff. And it, it goes like that. So you, you know, you're a huge part of the success of that music. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> so Travels in Neon wasn't played live. I would hope that it had been. Yeah, um, I think it's it was difficult um, probably getting that huge drum sound um, there. And, and, and yeah, I don't know whether Andy felt that perhaps it wasn't, um, you know, a live song, if you understand what I mean. A lot of, quite a bit of music, uh, uh, you know, may lend themselves to... Um, a visual thing or something like that but when you're playing a set live um i think we had enough material there it just i i just don't think we we felt that we could do it probably justice in a live situation you know without um you know a, a, a big production job on it you know which perhaps we might not have been able to have uh, delivered as good as what we could do well uh was that an example of the process where you guys would try to record the rhythm section live together at the same time? Uh, I mean, we all played when when we recorded these things. The whole band played these songs, and then if we if the drums were good, they kept the drums. If the if the bass and the drums were good at the same time, they keep that as well. But basically, you know, as long as the drums were you know, 
played well. Uh, the timing was consistent, you know, without lagging or speeding up and so on and so forth, because we never really played anything to a click track um, other than perhaps one song there that had a, a bit of a thing that I did myself. Um, they didn't really need a click it. track. A click track well, wasn't necessary because they had you. Well, I mean, really, that's the, the, the purpose of a drummer's job is he's the timekeeper, you know, I mean, I don't know, I think people tend, tend to have got away from that a little bit and uh, rely on other sources there to maintain uh, consistency. Um, I think it's important. Sometimes, you know, in a live situation there, you know, if you were really up for it, these things were going quite considerably faster than, uh, than what they should have been going. But um, that's youthful sort of um, enthusiasm, I guess, when you're 21 and you're you're sort of like full of uh, testosterone, you're sort of, <laughs> you're busting yourself, you know. But it depended. I didn't start all these songs, don't get me wrong. Some, <laughs> some of them started with the guitar, don't forget that. So if he starts here, I'm thinking, that's too fast, but I still got to stick with it, you know what I mean? Yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, whoever sort of said, one, two, three, four, away you went, you know. <laughs> I mean, that was it. Yeah. So... Uh, did, you must have had a, a ball playing live with XTC, did you not? Yeah, uh, yeah, to the extent I think Andy sacked me twice as a result. Of, uh, yeah, I was sort of sacked on two occasions. There one one time I got uh, hammered with the support band, and uh, I, d I did a pretty poor performance when I went on there, which was a big mistake. And um, I think there was another time in Birmingham. One time there, was, I, I was probably a little bit under the weather. And, um, you know, it's, um, you know, three strikes and you're out. But I had two of the strikes. <laughs> wow. So he was he was quite the taskmaster. Yeah, I don't know whether he was going through. I mean, it, I don't know. Maybe I, I, I was an easy target. I don't know. Uh, but well, um, yeah, it was probably justified, though, because, you know, you're young and I mean, we never really had anybody keeping control of us at all, you know. Mm -hmm. It was like uh, you were sort of in, in control of your own destiny. Although we had management, they had no idea what was going on, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, clearly you guys were self-contained as a unit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they didn't make any decisions as regards, you know, what we did, really. I mean, You know, also, uh, Andy mentioned to me that there were times where just you and he would record the basic track. Do you remember that? Just guitar yeah, well, and drums? Yeah, I mean, um, there were these, um, this Homo Safari series. There were some B-sides that uh, came out. As I say, um, Andy wanted to utilize all the time in the studio. And if there was some downtime or some time there where others weren't doing anything or for one reason or another, he wanted to utilize every moment we had in there. And quite often we would go in there and he'd say, look, um, can you just lay down a bass drum for me or or, or do something, uh, you know, um, a tambourine or just a hi-hat part or something of that nature. And, and although he's not a particularly good keyboard player and he's got he's got good rhythm in one thing or another, he's got some good ideas sound wise. And um, we, we ended up doing quite a few um, just, just, just the B-side, just Andy and myself, really. Oh, so those I mean, instrumentals, those instrumentals are just you and Andy? Uh, quite a few of them are, yeah. Cool. And were you playing electric drums on any of that stuff? Um, no, not as such. I had some uh, triggers that were on there, which are, uh, I had this thing, the Tama Sniper, they called it. It was uh, like a drum synth type thing there. And they were just sort of uh, basically the size of a 20 cent piece, you know, um, and they just used to gaffer tape onto the drums and they had a sensitivity on them. And they were pretty archaic compared to what the guys have got today. Um, so you had to make sure that you had the sensitivity right, otherwise the thing would be triggered by the sound from somewhere else and so on and so forth. But we started getting into those because I, I got a deal with Tama drums, um, like, likewise with uh, Stuart Copeland was the same. Um, and we both had these things and um, it was sort of part of the, part of the, the new whiz bangs and whistles uh, 
sort of thing that Tam will come up with. I thought, well, yeah. I mean, to the extent where we 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 use it on the bass drum there in um, a couple of songs. Uh, one of the massive bass drum. Um, oh, uh, like on maybe uh, run, Runaways. Yeah, Runaways was one. Yeah, that's that's the sort of thing there. So that was sort of like a that was the bass drum being played, but the trigger was giving it this synthetic sort of sound. Um, and likewise, uh, living through another Cuba, that was sort of like this sort of supposed to indicate missiles going off these whiz bangs and whistles. Um, that was another that was the other extreme end of this 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 contraption, you know, sort of like the high end and the bottom end. So uh, yeah, it was it was um, yeah, it was yeah, I was starting to get into that. Yeah. And then uh, love at first sight, too, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a bit more disco type uh, thing on the snare drum there that on reflection, I don't think it's aged particularly well. It's sort of when I not that I listen to it a great deal, but when I have listened to it, I thought, oh, you know, it doesn't sit too well with me now. Well, that's I something was, I wanted to ask you was, do you, have you had the opportunity to listen to any of the surround mixes or the remasters? Uh, I think I listened to some of the um, uh, 5.1, I think it was uh, the Drums and Wires one at Stuart Rose, who's an engineer that uh, did a thing with me and Colin, who's a good friend of Andy's, ran at his place. He had a 5.1 5 .1 setup at his place, said, have a listen to this. And you stand in the room and listen to it. Yeah, it was good, but um, I don't know whether... Um, you know, it's worth the extra money for all this stuff. I don't know whether it was, you know, it wasn't like the difference between mono and stereo. You know what I mean? It, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, um, when you think about it, years ago, I mean, the Who brought out that thing, Quadrophenia, didn't they? You know, it was a quadraphonic sound. It never really sort of took off that much, I don't think. But um, yeah, likewise with this thing, I don't know. I don't have... Um, means to it myself but i have heard it and i thought well it's okay but, yeah i think um, a lot of us enjoy it because it has bonus stuff like rehearsals yeah. and demos and you yeah. know instrumental mixes which is something that's been very interesting for us because we get to hear you even in greater detail yeah yeah i suppose with the added added material on there i suppose it gives us a little bit more legs but um as regards to the 5.1 thing itself i'm i don't know <laughs> i'm on the fence with that really understood um i'd love to talk to you about english settlement and um and sort of that process because now it's not stuff that's necessarily going to be played live does that change your job at all? Uh, well, English Settlement, we did start to play that live. What? Oh, like uh, what? Well, we played, um, well, Senses Working, Overtime. Um, what else did we play? Uh, yeah, we played quite a bit of that stuff live. Before recording it, or you mean after? Uh, good point. Um, yeah, I think it might have been after. I, I don't think we played a great deal of it beforehand. I don't think that I, I can remember. I, I stand corrected on that, but I can't re remember uh, playing too much of it before. Um, and then when you went in, this is still the stone room, and it's is yes. it's it's still it's still you Padgham, but not Steve Lillywhite. Yeah, that's right. Steve, um, at that particular point in time, we did the two hours. We did the Black Sea with that same team. Uh, Steve, I think, was already occupied working perhaps with you too, I think, at that point in time. I think he was already doing something. Um, and it gave us an opportunity. We said, well, we still want to use Hugh on this uh, because, you know, it was just such, such a good combination of... Uh, a, a good team and we and um i think andy managed to convince virgin that um, look we we think we can go in there and do it on our own with hugh you know and uh, by which time uh hugh had established himself as a good uh 
engineer stroke producer, I guess, himself. So um, they didn't think it was that much of a gamble. Um, and, and in the end, um, yeah, we sort of did it all together without the, well, a co-producer, I guess, the band and Hugh. And did you do overdubbing on that record? It seems like some of those parts might have been divided up into different tracks. Yeah, I think there was a few bits and pieces there that needed fattening up or whatever. Um, there was a few things. Uh, nothing really springs to mind uh, uh, specifically, but um, I think there was a few things there that probably, um, uh, yeah, possibly got overdubbed. Yeah, I can't re recall exactly which ones, but, um, you know, without sort of going over the tapes again and finding out, oh, yeah, that happened because um, <laughs> it was some time ago again. <laughs> sure, of course. One of my favorites on there is Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, yeah, I like that song a lot. I'm sure we played that live. Yeah, yeah, we did. Well, there's video of you guys playing in Germany where you're playing like Ball and Chain, yeah. you're playing Jason and the Argonauts, you're playing uh, Snowman. Yeah. But is that, that was just a sort of a, a few promotional shows after the album came out because you weren't going to tour again with Andy, right? Yeah, we were still touring. We we did some some gigs, you know. Oh, um, so, so so Europe. We did we did some gigs in Europe with that. Um, before he he took his bit of a turn in um, in Paris, he took a bit of a turn and um, yeah. So so yeah, they they started to get played live. And it wasn't until we got to the states, obviously, you know. It became apparent that um, he was in bad in in a bad way. Did you enjoy touring when you guys were touring? I enjoyed it. Yeah, I think uh, Colin enjoyed it to a certain extent. Uh, Dave certainly enjoyed it. I think Andy was the one that didn't. And I think towards the end, um, after we stopped playing live, I think um, Colin sort of thought, well, maybe live's not all it's cracked up to be either but uh, i think dave and myself and i i i'm playing live still well haven't been for 12 months but uh, intend to do so in uh, come july i hope what were some of the bands that you guys played with or toured with that you enjoyed um the first one that springs to mind i guess is uh, probably the police we we did quite a few I think we did two American tours with them and a couple of European tours as well, um, sharing the same bus at one point, uh, which um, I remember Stuart Copeland saying that uh, he felt that that was quite neighbourly of them, <laughs> 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 which uh, which uh, was quite good. That was that was great fun. It was such a good tour of that. Um, we also played with the Talking Heads in Europe, which was good fun as well. They were good people to work with um really enjoyable time you know uh blondie we played with um the cars we supported i think on a couple of occasions um who am i missing didn't you uh, play madison square garden opposite the yeah, cars with the cars yes yeah, support yeah. the cars yeah <laughs> yeah that was quite a daunting task too did you get on with Stuart copeland yeah we got on very well i think um all three of us. I think we actually got on better with them than they did with themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, Padgham, were just telling me a story that Stewart couldn't go on stage because he had had a brawl in the afternoon sound check with Sting, and Sting had broken yeah. s some of Stewart's ribs. Well, well, funnily enough, we were on tour with the police, and um, they wanted to go and record another album, which I think it turned out to be... Um, Ghost in the Machine, I think it was. Um, Sting asked us, any ideas about a good engineer? And we said, well, the guy we've been using over the last couple of albums was, was Hugh Padgham. You know, um, try and get hold of him. He's as, uh, as good as what we've ever had up to this point. And um, yeah, the rest is history. I think they recorded the album with him, but uh, you left. I don't know what the outcome of it really, other than the, I think it was an extremely good record. I love love the record, um, but um, 
at what cost it came, I don't, I don't quite know. Um, you, obviously, Hugh's the man to talk to about that. But um, I, does he still blame us for, for that recommendation? I don't know. But uh, no. I think he, financially, he's probably sort of got to ease some of the pain, I think. Well, you know yeah, I mean, look, it's personalities, right? I mean, it's so much of a job is, is dealing with all the different people. Yeah. I mean, later on, as you well know, um, there was problems with Andy and, and Todd Rundgren, you know, that's, you know, but uh, contrary to what uh, has been said, I don't think, um, I, I can't say on that session, of course, because I wasn't there, but uh, any of the sessions that um, I recorded, the albums that I recorded with, uh, with XTC and that, um, I don't recall ever having a problem with the producer, with Andy and... Um, I mean, we work with guys like Phil Wayneman, um, uh, Matt Langer, uh, Matt Lang, I should say, um, you know, and uh, no, I, I don't recall any arguments or or um, any bad feeling that took place at any of those things. Martin Russian was another one that recorded The Stranglers. Um, yeah. Steve Nye. Yeah. Steve Nye, I don't recall any problem with him although i was only there for about three record uh, three three songs of that album so um i don't know how the rest of it sort of went because they got a replacement drummer for me but um yeah any of the producers that we used to that i can recall there was never ever a problem so what went on between andy and todd is between them i guess oh yeah and they still made a great record well yeah you know i mean yeah it was a good record <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it, you know, I, I guess you want to leave as much as you can, just uh, leave egos out of it and try to get to the music, but sometimes the egos do get in the way. Yeah, um, as I say, I, it's um, pretty well documented. I think that there was there was problems in those sessions. So did you feel that you weren't... Uh, write for the material on on mama or did you did you not enjoy the material did, uh, when, what were the factors there for for your leaving uh basically i was pretty peed off about this business about not touring um and i thought to myself well if we're not going to go out and promote these things ourselves who do you expect to do it because the record company are going to be fed up they're, 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 they're not going to be happy if you're not going out there, you know, on the old treadmill again, they're promoting these things there. How is it going to be promoted? Um, you know, because not only were you on, out there on tour, but while you were doing that, you were doing radio stations and so on and so forth, promotional stuff while you're out there as well, which is, a, is, a, is an extra workload, agreed. But I mean, if, you want to, if, it, if it's worth making these records, you know, you want to go out and promote them. You know, I think it's 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 just been the way of the way these things are done. Uh, Andy chose not to do that. On top of that, when we started putting the material together for Mummer, I didn't think a lot of the songs. There were some some good songs on there, um, but I think as a whole, I don't think it was good enough to follow up the English settlement record. That was my opinion. You know, um, and um, I was a little bit uh, worried about the angle that the the direction in which this thing was going compared to where we were. I mean, I, I, obviously, Andy wanted to sort of move on again and say, well, OK, that's that. Let's move on to this. But um, for mine, the, the songs didn't seem to be quite as strong as what the previous three albums had been, you know, I think uh, there was a man that um, obviously had health issues. Um, I think, uh, you know, probably needed a rest, really. And um, to sort of like come back and then start writing songs there, um, I think he needed to, to, to reassess the situation and have some more time, I think. Mm. And that uh, wasn't allowed to happen. Um, and I thought, well, I don't know. Yeah. 
so so you moved to to Australia at that point. Yeah, I did. Yeah. But you were uh, immediately pretty much snatched up by Dragon, right? Well, they had a problem with their drummer, um, and I I'd been to Australia a couple of times with XTC and one thing and another, um, and uh, yeah, I, I I filled in for the for their drummer there for about eighteen months. Uh, it wasn't a great fit, but. Um, I had to earn some money doing something. So basically I was a gun for hire on that particular episode and did two records. I did one one um, album there, which I think, uh, well, I didn't do the whole album. I think I did about three three songs on one of them. And then, then, then there was a live double album that came out. So um, you toured with them? Yeah, yeah, we did quite a, quite a bit of touring over there in the 18 month period that I was there, yeah. How, how would you describe their music? uh sort of pop rock i guess um yeah it was um a little bit probably a little bit more uh, middle of the road than what xtc were i guess um but yeah it was sort of doable um but you know i always felt like the odd man out really <laughs> uh, did you have enough to do behind the drums for that music yeah. Yeah, I had enough to do. Yeah, yeah, I had to follow in other people's footsteps, pretty much. But um, yeah, there was enough to do. Yeah. Did you change your setup at all when when you went to that music? Um, no, not really. No, I think the set, my drum kit situation was pretty much the same. Were you always a Pisces symbol guy? Uh pretty much early. Yeah, pretty much throughout. Yeah. Yeah, although I've got some Zildjian symbols now. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, they just seem to seem to do the job for me. They are quite bright and loud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I use them as well. I I enjoy them. Yeah. So so you weren't. Sounds like you weren't particularly musically satisfied in in Dragon. No, not really. Um, they were an established band, and um, yeah, I never really felt sort of part of it, if you know what I mean. I suppose um, having come from the XTC situation, where we sort of all basically grew up together, I guess musically. Um, you know, you've got sort of like a bond of of um, you're like a band of brothers in a sense. You know what I mean? Um, where you've done so much together. Um, you know, from from the age of about 17, um, you know, um, you don't sort of pick up those sort of types of relationships later on in your life again, really. You know, it's like having school friends, you know, um, you know, you, you don't you pick up friends later on in life, but they're never, never quite the same as old friends, are they? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but the guys in Dragon must have been fans of your work with XTC. Um, I think the bass player Todd Hunter. I think he was um, aware of what was going on. I think he was the main one uh, reason that um, they got me in. I, I'm not quite sure whether the others were particularly enamoured with my uh, my ability, but. Um, yeah, I mean, a different style of drummer, really. But anyway, I think I got the job done for, for that particular point in time anyway. Yeah. So then you sort of knocked off drums for a while. Yeah, I, you know, I had a family at that point in time. And um, yeah, I sort of got a bit disillusioned with the music business at that point um, and just sort of went went off and um, worked in construction for a good while. Um, you know, at what point uh, uh, my marriage wasn't going particularly well there and I ended up getting divorced and um, I've, I've moved back to the UK. I've been here for nearly five years now. And um, uh, Colin asked me, um, because when, when, once I returned, you know, um, I still, I'm still a good friend with the guys. Uh, 
asked me, he said, look, I'm doing this solo sort of thing. Would you be interested in playing on it? And I said, well, I haven't played for a while, but yeah, it seems like a hoot. So, <laughs> so I got back into it with that, really. And, um, you know, you mentioned, was, you mentioned being sorry. friends with the guys, and, and, and I, I think a lot of people don't realize that you guys have sort of mellowed and, and kind of appreciate each other more, maybe uh, have more warmth going on in, in the group. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, although I left the band, um, it was never any sort of real Ill, Ill feeling over it. I mean, Andy and I are probably just as good friends now as what we've ever been, you know, I think it was because at the time I didn't realize that, um, you know, this, this, this illness that he had, you know, yeah. uh, this, um, I wasn't aware of it really. I didn't even know he was on Valium, you know, I mean, you know, um, Why would you? Not, yeah. not well, exactly. Until later on, I thought, well, I wasn't aware of it. You know, I just thought he was just being, you know, unhelpful. But um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I mean, we've never, we've never not spoken. You know, I mean, we've, 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 um, and I, as I say. You, we remain in reasonable contact and um yeah i think we're all i'm i'm, I'm good friends with all of them although <laughs> funnily enough they don't seem to be sort of getting on so well with each other but um <laughs> yeah so i don't know so let's talk a little bit about tc and i the group that that you formed with with colin upon your return to to swindon you released yeah. a, an ep which has some really cool stuff on it can you tell us a little bit about that yeah, well, those were songs that um, Colin just wanted to record. He wanted to get back in and do it. Yeah, pretty much uh, it was all um, Colin and I, apart from we got a sax saxophone player to do a little bit, and a, a young lady came in and did some singing on it as well. But other than that, it's just all Colin and myself. So Colin's playing guitar, keyboard, and bass, and singing. And I'm helping out uh, playing all the drums, the percussion that's on it, and some backing vocals. Oh, you did backing vocals? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I did some on some of the earlier stuff as well there that never got credited because it didn't justify <laughs> didn't justify getting a credit for. But um, yeah, a few ooh la la's here and there. And um, he, he felt that, um, you know, how do you feel about sort of performing some of these songs and some of the XDC songs that we've recorded that I didn't play on that never ever saw the light of day in a live idiom. And I said, well, I think that'd be a great idea. Do you, do you think we could do it? You know, because obviously we're 30 years older now. Um, is, it, is it really even possible? Um, but anyway, we sort of said, well, look, let's give it a go. And if, and if we don't feel that we're up for it, and I think we'll both know, and we're both honest enough and man enough to say, look, let's just leave it where it was. But, um, you know, we worked fairly hard at it. We got ourselves reasonably sort of fit and um, got a couple of other guys involved. Uh, Steve Tilling on um, guitar and Gary Bamford on keyboards. And um, we played a whole set of uh, six nights we did in Swindon. And uh, we did a whole set of Colin songs. It was one of Andy's theaters that we just sort of appreciate Andy's uh, effort. Uh, but Colin wanted to basically hear his songs in a live situation. So we made a list of, I don't know, 26 songs or something like that. And we, we got them up to speed and got these guys in there to do it. And we did six live gigs. Um, I thought, that uh, perhaps, you know, we would have may maybe taken it elsewhere as well. Uh, but um, I think when he had a look at it again, he thought, well, I don't really want to get back on that uh, treadmill again of going around playing live and all that busy, which was a bit disappointing for me. Because, um, you know, I put a lot of time and work and effort into all this, as the other guys did too. 
and thought, well, you know, we we need to sort of continue on with this thing there to to justify the time we've put into it, you know. So, uh, but he was adamant. He said, look, I don't really want to do this anymore, not this live thing. So that was another bit of a kick in the old proverbials. But um, I thought, well, look, this is a good band here. We need to now just get a bass player. So I tried to keep the fundamentally keep keep the band together. Although, um, as it stands at the moment, it's basically uh, only Steve and I remaining from that particular um, project. But we've got uh, a couple of other guys involved as well. We're going out as, the, as EXTC or XTC, EXTC. And we hope to be doing some live shows in, in July, if uh, all being well that uh, the Prime Minister allows us to do so. Um, you know, we really want to do it uh, to 100% capacity rather than sort of in this sort of um, isolation situation. I don't think it would be very fruitful to do that. So provided these venues are able to hold, you know, if there are 300 or 500 capacity, if we can potentially get 100% of those uh, uh, people in there, then um, it'll be worthwhile doing, and we'll see whether there's a demand for it or what. So um, my intentions are, uh, you know, if this thing is 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 accepted um, reasonably well, is to uh, do quite a few gigs, and we've got some interest from the United States as well, which um, might be interesting once things open up a little bit more. But uh, we'd love to have you. The, the difficulty being, of course, um, everybody's going to be in the same position. So uh, bands have been starved of playing, so they're all going to be out there and there's only going to be so many venues to play. So whether whether we get to a slice of the action or not, it will, it will sort of depend. Can you give us an idea of, of what kind of songs you guys were doing in TC and I and what you're going to be doing in terms of XTC material in your current XTC? Well, the current XTC thing there, we've um, we've pretty much got two hours of material uh, ready to go. Um, we intend to do well. We've got the material there to do two sets, and they're both basically nearly an hour long. Um, they they span from every everything from the oldest thing I think we do is Statue of Liberty, which is off the first record, and and we we play something from all of the albums even the stuff that um that i didn't play on so it goes like right what? through to wasp star oh really last yeah so basically everything i think the only album that we're not touching really is go to there's nothing on that at the moment because we've still got two hours of material there um from all these other albums and probably we, we tried to pick um a cross section of, of songs from all those records um, and I want to play them out there to people that um, haven't heard them before. Like what? Well, uh, King for a Day, I mean that, that's been played in a, in a TV situation. Um, there's a version of Dear God that's going to be done. Um, stupidly Happy. Um, yeah, basically, um, I haven't got a list in front of me here, but um, yeah, it's it's two hours of material spanning all the albums, really. So, um, yeah, depending on whether, you know, we're required to play two 45 minute or 50 minute sets or whether we just get an hour or maybe half an hour of the support to somebody else. But we'll have to trim the thing accordingly, I guess. But there's an abundance of material there. And, uh, it's, and, and everybody's playing very well, and um, yeah, I think we're doing a reasonable job of it. So, hopefully, in the not too distant future, we can get out and 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 do what we want to do. I certainly hope so. It would be be such a thrill to hear you live, Terry, because I I did not get the opportunity uh, when yeah. you guys were playing live because I was still in high school and and really not aware uh, of how to see you guys. Um, yeah. You know, you and I have something in common that I, I'd love to chat with you about a little bit, which is uh, we both have sons that are serious drummers. 
yeah <laughs> indeed yeah so you know it was a great joy to to share drumming with with my son as he was coming up and uh you know i showed him a few things at a certain point he didn't want to hear from me anymore about it yeah and he went his own way well yeah. I, you know how did, how did that work out with your boy quite similar to that um you know i used to just sort of play with uh a couple of sticks and on a couple of pillows on the lounge and this sort of thing there and he'd sit there with a pair of headphones on and just knock around like that and um he sort of enjoyed it and um he he sort of got fairly serious about it when he was about 14 i think you know because up until that point there you're not very strong are you you know you reach a certain age there there's certain things you can but um it's quite a physical thing isn't it playing drums and um you know just having the strength really to do it it's very difficult to think um to master the thing there but until you get sort of like into your teens so um yeah he continued on with it and i thought well it's you know i mean he'll choose i, I never force him into doing it it's, you either want to do these things or you don't uh, and i thought well look, that's the only thing i could teach him because i don't play anything else so um you know if he wanted to play guitar well that was going to involve getting lessons from somebody else or whatever but um he's, he's, he was like a duck to water with this stuff you know and um yeah i i uh you know before he could drive i was driving him to and to gigs and one thing and another they're doing his roadie they're doing the roadie bit i did the same and, thing um, <laughs> you know and uh, i mean he was even playing in pubs when he wasn't he was too young to even be in there really yeah um yeah so that was good fun and anyway as as you say i i could only teach him so much before he wanted to go on and play like uh you know the guy out of dream theater and all this sort of stuff so and i couldn't teach him that sort of stuff so uh it was like yeah i've learned as much as i can off you it's time to move on you know so um yeah he's a good player and um he's still playing a, a few bits and pieces in australia there now oh really what kind of stuff well it's sort of like pretty much metal stuff you know it's um that type of the band he was with there toured the in the states here on two or three occasions october rage they were called and um yeah they toured there for uh, um, a couple of years really um to and from you know um staying over there for about six months so um yeah they had a, a deal over there they released a couple of eps and one thing another couple of albums they're on air castle records i think they were based in uh, salt lake city or somewhere but um you know which uh helped them out a fair bit um but as as bands are you know that's um who knows where it's gonna go so we can hear him on an october rage recordings yeah yeah they, they can be googled up and, and uh google up october rage and they're on youtube they're doing some stuff and your boy's name is hi james hi. yeah that's so cool yeah so you can have a look at that on youtube there if you want <laughs> But uh, certainly not like, uh, I don't think it's for XTC fans, Sammy, but um, you know, this is a different generation, isn't it? Well, it is. And and honestly, and I've said this to, to Andy and Dave, I mean, there are some pretty heavy moments in, in, in XTC, and that would include Travels and Neil on as, as, as sort of uh, the heavier side of XTC. And yeah. so, you know, I don't see that huge divide between people that listen to, yeah. to metal and, and, and listen to XTC because there's also, depending on the metal, level of sophistication in, in some of the stuff rhythmically, right? Yeah, 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 that's for sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I mean, you know, XTC were a, were a band, but basically, you know, a 70s sort of 80s band as far as I was concerned. And um, obviously, you know, we're in a different era now. Well, I mean, I'm, not, I'm happy. It's still sort of appreciate. I'm surprised, really, that uh, people are still even talking about this stuff. But um, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, long may it be. <laughs> Listen, you know, XTC 
exists outside of time for, for, for many of us. Any yeah. classic music, it's not just of its era because it can live on its, its two legs going forward and it'll be here after we're gone and people will still be appreciating it. And that's because it's just high quality, high content music, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been quite a remarkable um, journey, really, uh, surprisingly. I, you know, if you'd have asked me, you know, 40 years ago um, that we would be doing this, I would have been very surprised and still am, actually. <laughs> well, you must be pleased when you hear about how many people still even more now are enjoying the music and view it as yeah. classic. Yes, it's almost unbelievable, to be quite honest. You know, at my age, I'm 65 now, and people are still listening to this stuff. It's, well, <laughs> it's, it's quite something. I'm still listening to it, and I have all my students listening to it, and, and we enjoy it and, and, and take it apart and talk about it and put it back together again. and. So it's, you know, that makes it a real pleasure for me to speak with you, Terry. Yeah, well, you know, I just sort of so pleased that um, it was sort of worth, worth, worth the effort. You know, it's, you know, if it had been just a five minute wonder and you've had 15 minutes of, um, well, fame, for the want of a better expression, um, it's 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 not very rewarding, but to think that um, after all this time, people are still enjoying this stuff is quite um, quite humbling, really. And on top of it all, Terry Chambers, you changed the world of drumming. Well, <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say for better. Did Andy play you Captain Beefheart and the drumbo drum parts? Was that something that he ever? Discuss with Captain Beefheart, he was very much a Captain Beefheart fan. He loved Devo, he loved craft work. Um, yeah, he played a lot of that stuff. And uh, did, did you like the Beefheart stuff? I couldn't understand it particularly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so um, to say I liked it, it would be a, an untruth. Um, I'm not a real big fan, to be honest. Um, uh, but perhaps if I listen to it now, perhaps I'd have a change of opinion because I probably, I mean, it wasn't, it wouldn't have been a record of my own personal choice back in that day. But uh, that I suppose, that, but, but Andy bringing that part of it into the group probably made it what it was, you know, um, us all coming from these different sort of uh, personal favorites, I guess. Did you take any notice of the beef heart drum parts? Uh, not that I can actually recall, but I appreciated what was sort of going on there. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, it, it, it wasn't something that um, I sort of fell in love with particularly, but um, yeah, I could appreciate it. And I thought, well, if he's in the band, if he's listening to this, I need to know something about it, you know? So that we're all on the same page, but um, yeah, not to my knowledge. Um, if there is something there, it's probably more by accident than anything else. Or filtered through Andy to you. Or filtered, yeah. He may have come along and said, "Look, what about hitting this one and then that one twice and then that one over there?" You know, some sort of linear thing. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. I mean, he, he probably got his message through there somehow. Did he sing? Unbeknown, uh, unbeknownst to me. <laughs> would, would Andy sing drum parts to you? Yeah, I mean, he's quite, he's, um, he's quite rhythmic. And he, um, yeah, he, he, you know, he all sort of, you know, <laughs> this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, all of that. It's fun to one of, one of, And he's one of the funniest people you'll ever meet on a day's march. He's an incredibly funny person. Yes, he is. Yeah. I told him that he should do voiceover work. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I mean, 
artistically, I mean, there's nothing the bloke can't do, really. I mean, he's, he paints, you know. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, uh, yeah. Songwriter, you know, he's, uh, he's irritatingly, um, <laughs> irritatingly um, <sighs> talented. Irritatingly so. <laughs> he is, he's a multifaceted artist. Yeah. 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 Well, Terry, thanks yeah. again. Uh, would love to to uh, to catch up with you again. And if if you're yeah. ever over here in the states, I will be there. Terry Chambers, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking time today. And you know, everybody, look out for XTC EX TC. Yeah. And. Uh, and of course, all the classic recordings, many of which are available now on on uh, 5.1 surround sound with instrumental mixes where you can hear Terry Chambers amazing drum parts going on very clearly and very strongly and very creatively. Thanks for listening, everybody. My guest has been the great Terry Chambers, and we will see you next time on the broadcast. Thank you, Thank Terry. You. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.